All right. Hello, everyone. Hello, 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 hello. We have a very big room, so if you, I guess you won't be able to sit down. Uh, sorry about that. Um, but um, if you want to start listening, uh, today we have a great speaker who needs no introduction whatsoever. Um, it's Bruce Rosen, which is the director of the Martino Center. There is your introduction right there, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and I should also say that we are recording this talk, so if you're standing behind that huge pillar, for instance, uh, and can't see anything, it will be on the uh, Martinez webpage and on YouTube. Um, so I'm sure you will be a big YouTube phenomenon. All right, so without further ado, Bruce Rosen. Uh, okay. Yay, wow. Thanks. Okay, so um, uh, thanks for the uh, nice introduction. Thank you all for uh, showing up. Um, the feedback I got from the last talk uh, I gave here was uh, that it was pretty terrible and mostly because it was so far in the future and, uh, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, kind of fanciful that, uh, you know, this time I should talk about uh, something a little closer to the here and now. So um, that's my uh, job. Uh, we'll see if I can do it in 10 minutes, something pretty close to that. Uh, top 10 new resources for the uh, Martino Center. And I know many of you, uh, um, uh, many of you know some of these and some of you know many of these, uh, but hopefully uh, many of you don't know many of them and there'll be something <laughs> new uh, for each of you. Okay, so number 10, uh, right down the hall here, a, we have a new MEG shielded room, uh, which is very cool. And even cooler still is what's inside. Uh, OPM stands for the uh, Optically Pumped Magnetometers. Uh, this is an OPM MEG and not the typical squid MEG. Uh, and the cool thing about the OPMs is that they're much uh, uh, less sensitive to uh, the effects of uh, external magnetic fields. So this one is actually integrated in with uh, transcutaneous magnetic stimulation, TMS. And actually a novel design there is that this is not just a single loop coil, but an actual array of coils. So now we can both stimulate the brain, do so with precise targeting based on the array TMS, and then see the results of its uh, action on the brain. Uh, and uh, because they're OPMs, they won't blow up when you turn on the TMS. So this is a very cool thing. We're very excited about that. If you're interested, uh, talk to uh, Apo Neumannbach. Okay, number nine, uh, the, uh, the uh, I3, the uh, Institute for Innovation and Imaging, as you all should know, uh, an organization run by uh, Peter Caravan uh, from the Martino Center and John Chen. They're opening up a brand new radiochemistry facility to complement the one that's on the first floor. This will be on the second floor just above us. You probably can't really read these details. I can't either. But the bottom line is uh, it's uh, uh, cool and very important because uh, these uh, metals um, tend to have long half-lives and you really don't want to like mix them up with the very short half-lives that we produce from our cyclotron. These uh, tend to either be uh, produced outside or from generators. So having uh, you know, good hygiene in the pet world, uh, nuclear medicine world, is to keep your long-lived stuff separate from your short-lived stuff. So they're creating a whole new uh, uh, radiochemistry facility, full uh, you know, pharmacy for uh, human studies. They've already begun to do some of these human studies with some of uh, uh, Peter Caravan's cool new agents that target uh, thrombus and uh, fibrinogen, but now we'll have a whole laboratory set up to do that. Okay, number eight, two million dollars in new computational hardware. The picture, of course, is not new. I grabbed something from the 60s. <laughs> Who even knows what modern uh, looks like? Uh, and, but one of the reasons I did this is, uh, to be honest, this is one of these situations where we have the money in hand and we don't even entirely know what we're gonna spend it on. Uh, you know, if we go to cloud storage, maybe we don't need nine petabytes of storage, which is what we put in the grant. Uh, you know, if we're going to do uh, cloud GPU, uh, you know, how many, uh, you know, V100s uh, do we need? It's not entirely clear. If you have opinions on this, we'd like to hear them. Uh, talk to uh, uh, Bruce Fischel or Jay Shri Kalpathy Kramer are helping us organize this. But the bottom line is we do have a nice chunk of change, like I said, on order of, uh, you know, nine to ten petabytes equivalent. Uh, lots of new GPUs for your AI applications uh, should be a, a great new system. Uh, the money's here. We just have to decide exactly what we want before we pull the trigger. Okay, number seven, of course, is the new 7T. Of all the things, it's one of the few that's actually really here and now. 
but uh, I think it's really only coming online now. Uh, for those of you that don't know, the Terra is uh, Siemens kind of a latest uh, FDA approved device, uh, 7T device. So it's really the only FDA approved seven Tesla scanner on the planet. Um, uh, and of course, uh, you know, uh, in typical Martino's fashion, we don't only have one 7T scanner, we have to have two of them. We have the latest one. Uh, John Kirsch has been working extremely hard to kind of uh, beat the bugs out of it. Uh, I think we're pretty darn close uh, and it should be uh, open for business and we want to use it, right? The whole point of having this is this should be our kind of, uh, you know, bread and butter 7T studies, right? For us, 7T should be bread and butter. Um, while, you know, uh, Bay 5 will continue to be for advanced applications, hopefully it will also get its uh, uh, self uh, upgraded with uh, new gradients and other cool capabilities. Uh, but if you're doing 3T studies now, think about uh, the cool stuff you want to do at uh, 70. Okay, number six, carbon 13 hyperpolarizer. So uh, uh, for the pet folks, you know about carbon 11, another isotope of carbon, carbon 13, uh, has a spin one half. Uh, and there's a very clever games that folks like uh, Matt Rosen uh, can play. Uh, knows how to play that uh, allow us to generate, uh, you know, a thousand times the signal from what you would normally see if you were to just do kind of conventional NMR on a carbon-13 signal through this process of hyperpolarization. Uh, the result of that is that you can actually take pretty good-looking images of things that have uh, a carbon-13, uh, you know, label. Carbon-13 is a stable isotope, no uh, radioactivity. Uh, the uh, physics behind it is interesting. We'll have Matt give a 10-minute lecture on that sometime soon. The real person to thank for this is Yi Fen, uh, who uh, wrote the shared instrument grant uh, for this, who has experience using this C13 hyperpolarizer when she was out in California. Uh, and so, um, you know, we're very excited to have this. It's a brand new technology. It's, uh, you know, again, one of these interfaces between kind of MRI and molecular imaging. Uh, very cool technology. We're super excited to have it. Okay, number five, it's another C13 hyperpolarizer. <laughs> Again, in typical Martino's fashion, he did such a great job in negotiating. Uh, you know, she got one and got one free. Uh, <laughs> and you might wonder, why would you possibly want two hyperpolarizers? But the answer is you do, right? We're gonna have one for our animal systems. Oh, I forgot to mention the challenge of C13 is that the half-life of these is uh, is not uh, you know hours uh, like in the, the um, those uh, metals, uh, not the minutes like in carbon or fluorine, but the seconds. So literally, when you do these experiments, you hyperpolarize it, and you have to run to the MR system to uh, take a picture, so that we don't have people sprinting across the building. We're going to have one next to the animal suite and one dedicated for human imaging. Um, so we're going to again have. Uh, uh, a full comprehensive ability to do these uh, hyperpolarized studies. Okay, uh, number four, our own holodeck, right? The data visualization room, that's gonna live on the 10th floor. You might actually, if you live up there or you pass up there, you might see that there's a room that says data visualization in it. Right now it's kind of empty, but uh, again, through that same uh, grant uh, that uh, Bruce Fischel and colleagues wrote to get us the computer equipment, um, we slipped in my fancy, uh, which was, uh, you know, some very cool data visualization space. Uh, and, you know, uh, at this point, they've actually uh, uh, decided on the equipment that's going to live in there. It's going to have kind of three main components. Uh, one is going to be uh, just a, a big um, uh, a panel array of what do we call it, the video wall. So I think it's, uh, you know, four by four 4K screens. Uh, so uh, many, uh, many, uh, many bytes there for your very dense data sets, for your pathology data sets where, you know, the images are enormously large. If we want to scroll from, you know, EM scales up to, you know, uh, MR scales, uh, you know, uh, we'll have, uh, you know, the wall to be able to visualize it. There is this uh, so-called kind of data cave or projection area, which is a, a, a virtual reality space that we'll be able to uh, create. Uh, and then we'll also have some of the new Microsoft HoloLens uh, 2.0 systems uh, for uh, augmented reality uh, uh, things. Um, so to be honest, I like had this uh, idea, just had this idea that we should build this thing. Uh, and, but it's a little bit, we're going to, you know, if you build it, they will come. Uh, I don't entirely know what we're going to use this for, but I'm hoping 
somewhere out of the 200 people uh, listening that some people will have a cool idea for how they would want to use um, and play with their uh, and interact with their data in lots of cool ways. Uh, we have uh, uh, Noam Pellet and uh, uh, Rupang Wang, who are expert data visualization software engineers, who are going to be helping us. Uh, and Jess Gerber is uh, helping us kind of organize this. Uh, and so think about how you're going to want to use it, and then uh, talk to Jess and let's use it. Uh, so while we have Jess queued up, let me go to number three which is a very, uh, also very interesting uh, a new adventure. This one is done in partnership with the IBC, another one of our famous three-letter acronyms, the Interdepartmental Brain Center, and the I3, which you heard about previously. Uh, and that's to create a four-letter acronym, three plus three in this case is four, uh, the Clinical Translational Research Unit, or CTRU. Many of you know on the second floor there is this um, what used to be the uh, GCRC, the General Clinical Research Center, uh, imaging satellite. Uh, it was like a great idea, but it was, you know, tended to be difficult uh, for us to access due to some of the regulations around it. And uh, with uh, uh, many years of diligent uh, discussions, we managed to uh, talk uh, uh, our VP for research, Harry Orff, into essentially turning that space over to us, and not only turning it over to us, but expanding it. So the footprint of this new clinical translational center is about twice what the original one is. Again, uh, this is only a part of the footprint. It also extends on the other side. But you see this very extensive list of support facilities for clinical translational research. And because of the connections to the IBC and the I3, essentially any human investigative study that uses uh, our resources uh, you know, is eligible to uh, use these. Jess is the person to wait, wait, if people don't know Jess Wade, there she is. She's the person to talk to. Uh, it's going to be about the next year as it's uh, being built out. But before then, she's going to be setting up what this core facility will look like. This is kind of a partial list of the kind of things that are going to be on there. Uh, cool lab equipment for behavioral characterization, blood work, nursing support, etc. All the things that you need to do, human investigations. Um, and uh, all in uh, one uh, nice place and hopefully one that uh, we will have access to. So now I've kind of given you, uh, you know, uh, some of the things that are happening in the Martina Center. You'll see some of them, of course, are already here. Some will be uh, arriving over the next, uh, you know, uh, several months. Be excited about that. But I, of course, saved the, uh, uh, the best uh, two uh, for last. Um, so number two in our list of new resources, the high-end coffee maker. <laughs> There, there is a commitment. Bruce Fischel has uh, promised that he will personally pull, you know, an espresso uh, for everybody that walks up to him. Make sure you tell him that I told you that. Since I don't see him here, we can get away with this. So uh, we've been talking about this for a long time. I think they have finally uh, pinned down the coffee maker that they're going to put up on the 10th floor. We're very excited about that. And I'm waiting for this scene to be true. I think I get the first cup, though. Uh, I think I get the first cup. Okay, and number one, the number one top resource in the Martino Center, the return of Carol. Yay! Yay. Many of you who are here from uh, overseas have uh, benefited from Carol's uh, diligent work over many, many years at the center. Carol, as you may know, retired not long ago, but with the departure of Alex for another position, we brought her back. So she's yet another, uh, you know, which just goes to prove that you can try to escape the Martino Center, but there really <laughs> is no escape. Uh, okay, so uh, close to my uh, time limit. Uh, thank you all very much.